Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Southeast Radio. My final guest this morning is Tom Cullen, Deputy Director General of the Society of the Irish Motor Industry. At a time of supply issues and a phasing out of BIK exemptions for electric vehicles, Tom joins us to provide an insight into the expected performance of the motor trade this year. Tom, let's start by looking back at 2022. How did the motor industry perform last year? It was a mixed bag, Carl. You know, it was a it was a very challenging year for us because coming out of COVID, um, there was a great demand. People had saved money. There was demand. We had plenty of interest. We were very worried during COVID of what would happen in the industry. But we did bounce. Um, uh, the difficulty became the uh, the crisis with the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia. That created huge supply issues globally. Post-COVID had huge supply issues, and that's that's what we've been dealing with. Now, there's been good things, signs of that as well, and that used car values have been, remained robust. You know, we're always concerned about them in the industry. Um, but, but yeah, o- overall, the new car market itself was way back from where it should be from a functioning economy. We should be doing around 150,000 new units every year. Um, we did 105,000 units last year, so that, and that's 10% back on pre-COVID numbers. So we're, we're definitely not where we need to be in terms of new cars. Used cars were way back as well, but the, uh, but the margins on used cars and the... the uh, the robust values of used cars were good during the year. So uh, a mixed bag. That being said, the aftermarket, people servicing cars, that was very, very good. And 2022 was a landmark year with many drivers transitioning to electric vehicles. Yeah, so so we're seeing steady increases, you know, quite, quite very significant increases, I should say, in the amount of electric vehicles that are being sold. So between hybrid, plug-in hybrid and electric vehicles, that's taken up about 43% of the market now. And when you look back, we, you know, if, to come back, if I can go back to 2008 when the taxa- taxation changed on vehicles, we went from a 70% petrol market to a 70% diesel market. And now diesel is back at 27% uh, of the new car sales. So we can see that that transition is, t- place, that transition is taking place quite rapidly. That being said, we have 60,000 you know, electric vehicles on in the car park at the moment, was, you know, one and a half, two percent of the overall market with 2.3 million cars. So we've one hell of a long journey to go to get to an electric vehicle fleet. But at the same time, you know, the, the numbers are good. Yeah, transition's happening. Something that's very topical at the moment is lengthy delays associated with securing an appointment for an NCT. How much of an issue is this causing for SIMI members? Yeah, very tricky. You, you know, when you deliver a used car to your customer, you want to deliver it with, a, with the up-to-date NCT cert. And, uh, and where vehicles are out, outside of NCT, that has been difficult. Now, we empathise and sympathise somewhat with the NCT in that labour shortages are a challenge for most sectors at the moment, including ourselves. Mechanics, technicians, etc., are are very um, uh, are very desirable uh, employees to have at the moment. Um, and the same thing at the NCT, they are having problems with staffing, with labour shortages, and that's having a knock-on effect on the NCT appointments. Some of which are out. You know, if you book one now, you might wait until July uh, to get an appointment. Which is, you know, the guards have said it's. You know, the guards have said it's. If you have an appointment with you in the car or on your phone, you know, you're not going to face the rigours of the of road traffic law. But at the same time, it's not good to have cars that are possibly not safe on the road, and it's a challenge for our industry. So yeah, that's something that needs immediate addressing. On the topic of labour shortages, how important are mechanic apprenticeships in addressing this problem? Oh, so important, Carl. Uh, I think, and, and I mean, you have a really good uh, view of the industry. I mean, you, I know you're interested in it, um, but we put so much time and effort into into getting people into the apprenticeship programmes. It's so important for the future of our industry. And when we go through recessionary times and difficulty, we lose a lot of our key employees. You know, they either they they go to other countries, or you know, or we're not, you know, they're not coming in at the bottom end. So we have a challenge, you know, almost every uh, parent out there wants their child to go to college. But it has to be seen that, you know, college is not for everyone. And there are amazing kids out there that have brilliant problem-solving skills that, uh, that, you know, that we find and that we get them into the industry. But there's never enough of them. We always want more. Um, and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's great to be able to start work to earn money and to learn at the same time. And, uh, you know, if you're in Wexford or any of the counties in, in the country, you're able to live near at home, near home, uh, and work locally. So, you know, there's great benefits to the apprenticeship programme. There has been a global supply issue since the onset of COVID, but is this getting any better now? 
It's getting better, but I would say only marginally. We we have you know we have some vehicles that are have better supply chains than others, um, but overall there is there are still supply chain issues. So the 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 Russian Ukrainian invasion, the uh, the the post COVID issues that we had with semiconductors, they're all still there. Um, they are getting better, and you know we keep saying there's light at the end of the tunnel. By the beginning of 2022, we were saying there's light at the end of the tunnel, and we still ended up that, with those challenges throughout the year. So the idea of walking into a, a garage today and having your new car in six weeks' time, if it's in stock, no problem. But if it has to be ordered, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take longer than that. And I'd say we're going to see a good bit of that still throughout 2023. And of course, because of Brexit, the UK is practically closed to Irish car dealers from an import perspective. Yeah, it, it is. You know, you're facing 10% tariffs on most of the vehicles that can be brought in. Um, so, so since the UK left the European Union, the, the, the idea that we can bring cars easily in from the UK is not there anymore. They are more expensive, but m- probably at the core of all this is that they're facing similar post-pandemic and global issues that we, the same issues that we are, in that they want their own used cars. You know, they, they don't need to sell them to the Irish market because there are plenty of people ready to buy them in the UK. So they're not, they're not producing enough new cars as, as the same as we are. So we're, 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 the UK, similar to Ireland, similar to all European countries, facing the same global supply issues. So those second-hand vehicles are not there. Now, there are many benefits to having a market in Ireland where you know the value of a used car and it's not being dictated to you by the by the value of a car that can be brought in from the UK because that distorts all the market. So it is it is a stable market when you know the price of a used car relative to the price of a new car and what the cost of change is. But yeah, it, it, it is causing serious supply issues because plenty of our own dealers would be bringing in cars from the UK if they had the opportunity. They're having to look further afield now, but those readily available vehicles are not there. So overall, it's not good for the industry. The north of Ireland is another potential option. You do avoid some of the taxes if the car was originally registered there but in most cases it still doesn't make it feasible to import a used car from there tom does it no like the 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 number of vehicles in the in the north is you know it's it's small in comparison to the uk market um there are issues with bringing in cars from the north as well um similar because uh, while they are while they have special arrangements those protocols you know are, are change are, could change and are changing all the time so we don't have that readily available supply from any market so you know we also have cars coming in from from Japan which we had back in the 70s and that's happening again now but again the numbers are relatively small it's not the type of car that everybody wants um, uh, so yeah we, you know the only way to fix the Irish market with regards to supply is to is to is to sell more new cars those new cars then in three or four years time become good quality used cars and that you know most people are not fortunate enough to be able to afford a new car so they're really looking for the used car and and that's that's why we have to really push and get our own cars and and more importantly for the electrification of the irish motor fleet we need to sell more electric vehicles and more new cars to sell more electric vehicles and that's really really important to create the four-year-old and the seven-year-old and the ten-year-old electric car that somebody finds affordable because that's the that's the piece of the market they're in in an attempt to incentivize the sale of new electric vehicles the government was very proactive in relation to bik exemptions for companies over recent years but these are now being phased out Yeah, one of the really disappointing things for anybody looking at the transition to electric vehicles is the changes to BIK. Um, I keep mentioning the three and four year market and it's it's, 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 it's apt to talk about it now because if you really want to get a lot of electric vehicles into the used car market and forget about the new car market, but you have to sell new cars and the business fleets buy new cars. You know, they buy them for their managers, they're part of their company policy um you know if you take the sales representative out of it you are getting people who are managers get company cars but they change them every three to four years and as a result of that they become a really good quality used car in three to four years somebody buys that keeps it for three or four years and then it becomes a really good car that's seven or eight years of age the bik benefit you know it could push people into alternatives and out of that company new company car benefit and as a result that diminishes the number of used cars in the market so i think that's a a challenge i I think uh, the government themselves could have dealt with that a little bit more um, proactively it's it's great to talk about huge numbers of electric electric vehicles and a massive change but if you don't put the right infrastructure in place in terms of charging charging vehicles and if you don't put the right mechanisms in place for those new vehicles and used vehicles to be created in the market then putting targets in place is pointless because they won't be reached.
And what impact do you expect this decision to have on companies investing in electric fleets over the coming years? Yeah, I, I think, I, I'm not, to be honest, I'm really not sure. I think uh, there are a lot of people that are really uh, see the company car as a great benefit. Um, it's a status piece for many people, you know, when they're sitting in their driveway in their company car and it's an executive model or whatever. That's part of what people have, are in their, in their job for. So I think to make changes in that can be tricky. I, I think we, we, we should be trying to, if we were to really want to have a lot of electric vehicles in the market, we should be trying to increase the business fleet, get more people into company cars, because the more people we have in company cars, they change them quickly. Most people drive, the average age of a car in Ireland is nine years of age now. So people don't keep, people keep their cars for nine, ten years now on average. So we really need to increase that business fleet. So, you know, uh, while the BIK benefits have been altered and changed, won't affect everyone, but it will affect some people negatively. And, uh, and for that reason, I think the government need to look at the company fleets and say, that's our, that's our quickest benefit in terms of creating electric vehicles and and that should be supported. And has the SIMI been actively lobbying government about this decision? It was always a benefit that was on the table to be taken and uh, and we've made these arguments really strongly with government for years now to say BIK is what what you know that's why people stay in company cars and they're the ones that will quickest become the used car if you make that car electric for say a manager working in a company in Wexford they're not doing a lot of mileage so they don't need a particular type of car they could drive an electric car because the range will suit them and they then they change it in three years time and now suddenly you've got a really good quality three-year-old or four-year-old electric car that somebody can afford to buy and that quickly becomes then a 10 year old electric car that someone could buy and if we you know we need to get people out of older cars um, but in order to do that we have to create this this uh, this chain of electric vehicles that is going down through the fleet to so everybody can afford one. Tom what are your thoughts on the electric car charging infrastructure which is currently available to the public? Well look it's it's disappointing you know it doesn't it, it's not fit for purpose if you take the evolved countries like norway you know those countries have sold you know they, they have a significant number of electric vehicles that they're selling as new now but they're not able to be, keep up with the demand in, t- in terms of charging infrastructure uh i we our charging infrastructure isn't fit for purpose i i think we have a huge opportunity because the charging infrastructure that we have we're, we're going to put in place now is going to be one that, that should be fit for purpose. I think it needs huge investment. I think some of that investment has to come from the private sector. Uh, we will see charging then. You know, we will see you know, business models for, for charging infrastructure. But if you're, if you're, most people will charge from home for, if they're going from, you know, if you're, if you're living in Rosslare and you're coming into Wexford town and you're, you're, you know, you're working in town, an electric vehicle is going to be absolutely perfect here for those trips all the time. But if you have to go to Dublin, you want to know that you have enough charge in your vehicle vehicle to be able to get there and if not if there's if you if you need to stop off in Gore, you want to know that there's a good quality infrastructure there that within 30 minutes you've got enough charge maybe 80 percent in your battery to get you to dublin and get you back down again so that's what we have to create those that really good quality infrastructure around the country and that needs to be done now and i would say even more importantly than the financial model to do that I think it's really important that the planning applications, that if you're a business that wants to put an infrastructure, a charging infrastructure into your company, like if you take any of the big companies in, in Wexford or the surrounding areas, if they want to put a charger into their, into their car park for staff, they, that should be a really easy process. They should, it shouldn't be a big planning application. It, there should be no issues with BIK. There should be all those things should be sorted out. So it makes it very easy for people to make that decision. Tom, the value of used cars has never been as strong. So how long more do you expect this to continue? Yeah, I, I, I can't see it changing for, for some time because of the supply issues. So if we go through another year, then we're going we're gonna to be f- faced with the same situation. I think it's worth noting that for most people who are going to change, it's, it's always about the cost of change. So the value of the car that you're driving at the moment is appreciating um, because of supply. And then the car that you're going to purchase is going to be appreciating as well. But it's the amount of money that it costs you to change into that other car is the key for everyone. So that, that usually doesn't change too much um, but I do see robust used car values remaining until we see a global supply chain um, a change and get better and of course we're still three or four years away from solid state batteries from becoming mainstream these will be half the cost and with twice the range well you, do, you really do know your stuff car <laughs> solid state batteries yeah I, I, you know I, I don't know enough about them but 
certainly when you listen to the technology experts at a global level in this industry, um, electric batteries at the moment, again, as I mentioned, with those, those resources which have become more and more expensive, if the solid-state battery is, if that's cracked in terms of uh, the performance and if it's cracked in terms of the ability to mass-produce it, then that's, that seems like it's a really, really valid solution for the future, all right? Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Tom Cullen, the Deputy Director General of SIMI, and I would like to thank Tom for sharing such a candid assessment of the industry with us this morning. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.